So growing up in Accra, Ghana, my first encounter with a fisherman was somewhere in the 90s. Um, as a child then, a boy, I was advised, you know, to spend my time reading. So I spent a lot of time in the library. Good. Our library was a bit close to the ocean. So um, anytime I go to the library, I'll take a quick dash to the beach, one, to play with my friends. It was exciting. So back at the beach, we would wade in the ebb and flow of the tide. We would play soccer, play with some wheels, uh, jump around, get ourselves wet. And we had fun, you know, it was, it was amazing. But that wasn't the only motivation for going out there to the beach. Um, out at the beach, we will help fishermen pull in the catch for the day. And uh, after doing all of that, we were rewarded for our efforts. We were given fish, and it was like food on the table. We came home, enjoyed it, you know, fried it and all of that. Um, but over time, this interesting scene where you see fishermen happily paddling their uh, frail canoes on the crest of those stormy waves and all of that, it's, it's slowly disappearing. I mean, um, you go out there, you see a lot of women with pans shouting, trading in fish, but you don't seem to see that anymore. The situation is a bit, uh, is a bit bleak. So, um, dotted along um, Ghana's coastline, there are about 300 landing beaches. So we have about 500 kilometers of coastline, right? And within that stretch of space, you have about 300 landing beaches, and it was full of activity, but that is not a picture anymore. If you go out there, these are the sort of things you would see. Broken down canoes, weak ones, the beaches are isolated. So I'm, I guess most of you are asking yourself, what had changed? This is the reason. We have a depleted resources out there. There are huge industrial boats from different parts of the world. They can easily and freely move into our maritime space and scoop, up, scoop out all our fishes. Unfortunately, our artisanal, artisanal fishermen cannot compete. Like you saw, most of them, all they have are outboard motors. They can't go far, they can't speed, you know. But these guys have got huge engines and they can do whatever they want. They have huge nets, sometimes as big as the football field. And it, it has huge devastating effects. I mean, so I, I get to work with fishermen a lot. And when I have to chat with them, they tell you the sort of problems they go through. Now, they are not catching fishes. There is environmental degradation, a lot of plastics in, 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 our, in our ocean. So they, they throw their nets out and they, they catch nothing except polythene bags. They come home with nothing. How do they feed their kids? How do they buy them books for school? So um, this, this, this has... It gets, it gets a bit personal with, I get personal with that. I mean, so that was one of the motivations for even getting into marine science. I mean, yeah, I said, hey, how can you help change lives, improve lives, put food on the table? So that was my reason for getting into that. So I'm not, I'm not also saying our governments are not doing anything about it. They are trying. But unfortunately, from a developing country, we don't have all the resources. We don't have all the expertise. We don't have all the equipment to chase these boats. I mean, to, to look at, to be able to protect the ocean, you need to have very fast boats. But one, there's one limitation, and it's the vastness of the ocean. I mean, you have a huge ocean out there, you don't have enough boats, and you can't go everywhere, right? So our fishes managers are a bit handicapped. They sit back at the offices, in the monitoring and control and surveillance units and don't know where to send out these speedboats. It, it, it becomes a challenge. So one of our re reasons for getting into all of this is to take advantage of what remote sensing and satellite provides. Now, it's been good news all this week. Um, gladly, we have Sentinel-3 in space, so we have an extra eye at sea. 
looking at the ocean. Again, from, from Ghana, you need to understand how processes within the ocean impact or drive fishes, right? Um, if you don't have research vessels, there's little we can do. But thanks to satellites, we can monitor features within the ocean, processes within the ocean that drives um, fish distribution. You can look at upwelling features, you can track currents, you can look at uh, fronts and so forth. And think of all of these as the huge restaurants within the ocean. So that is where all these fishes aggregate to feed. So it's very simple. If you want to police your waters, you should be looking at these sort of maps, and you have a fair idea where you want to, one, maybe send out your navies to police those waters. So that is what I'm going to talk about. Um, to do this properly, you would need to have um, catch data. But that is another challenge, right? So, okay, this is what you would expect. You would expect that fishermen come and tell you where they had caught fish A, B, and C. I had caught this number of quanti quantities and so forth. But unfortunately, we are unable to get that sort of information to develop tools and materials that can help us know where our productive regions are. So, um, until recently, we started using AIS data. When I say AIS data, I mean um, vessels, or most classes of vessels are supposed to have beacons on them. So, like, you can track your cars, you can track where fishing boats go. Most industrial fishing vessels do have that. But the semi-industrial vessels, or some of the artisanal vessels, don't have it. Um, you can see the, that orange device there. It's a beacon. We put it, that's me doing that. You, you put it on, on the boat, and you can know wherever they go. Um, it also has other features for safety at sea. There's a button, you push it, and if the fisherman is in distress, other vessels nearby can get some signal, a signal to know that, yes, there's something nearby, we can go help. So using this information, we are able to look at the trajectories of vessels. I am not showing the artisanal ones. Um, these are for industrial fishing fleets. On the average, we have about, uh, let's say, 400 in, in a day fishing vessels operating within that space. Isn't this exciting? You sit at your desktop and you have a fair idea of what is happening within your maritime space. Now, you can see the vessels moving. Um, so, like I had indicated earlier, to be able to know where fishermen go to fish, I need to have catch data. It is scanty, sometimes not available. But fishing vessels do three things. They are either at port, waiting to go to sea, or they speed to sea, and when they get to fishing grounds, they slow down. So when you do a plot of their trajectories, you can discriminate between when they are speeding to fishing grounds and when they are fishing. So you have a speed range. Very simple. When you then take their tra trajectories for a day, you take satellite data, Mercato products, you overlay them. You're, over here, you can see black dots. The black dots are the general trajectory. But the cyan ones are areas that we think they might have slowed down to fish. We can easily extract those environmental parameters there, and we have a huge data set to, to build models. So this is one, an example of a model that we have built. What this model does is, it looks at, it takes presence and absence data. So I'm unable to know how many fish you had caught, but I know that you might have fished within this space, or you did not fish. So we build a presence and absence data plus environmental data, and we are able to model and say, within this range of, let's say, sea surface temperature, we think fishes aggregate within that, that area. Within this range of um, sea surface height, fishes prefer that environment. Now, the model puts weights on these values, and they tell you where your fishing grounds are. So on my right, that should be your left. Um, you can see a map, that map. It tells you for a particular day where your fishing grounds are. The exciting thing about this is that um, we, we are able to have access to forecast data 10 days ahead. 
So we are able to predict 10 days ahead where we think the ocean will be productive. Illegal fishing are likely to go to happen there. Because, and this is what we have come to realize, um, these industrial fishing vessels do pay money to companies to provide them some satellite data. So they do have a fair idea beforehand where to go. Our managers sit in our, in our offices and they are unable to do that. But thanks to what we do at the university, we can make this sort of information available to our fishermen. So how useful is this data set? This comes in two formats, a JPEG, just an image like this, and a TIFF. A TIFF file is georeferenced, so anyone who wants to build on that can just load it up in a GIS uh, platform and do a bit more. The other exciting thing about this sort of information is that um, Kusto might have spoken about MPAs and all of that. If we don't have any MPAs in most parts of West Africa, but in the future, that's something I'm going to work on. This becomes very, very useful because when you accumulate a lot of data and, do, and you run some analytics on them, you can easily map out areas that you think are very productive. Fishermen often go there to fish, and that perhaps you need to geofence it, right? So slowly, we have started with nothing to develop stuff like this that we can readily make available to fish, uh, fisheries managers, and they are, they are using it happily. Thank you very much.